This is the first in a series of videos on probability. In this video, we're going to start with some vocabulary, and then we're going to go on to talk about uh, listing the possible outcomes in a probability experiment. So some of the words that we use in probability experiments, the first one is event. And in all honesty, event just means something happened. For our purposes, we're going to have two kinds of events. We're going to have a simple event, which is only one thing happened. Or from a more practical perspective, I know the probability of this thing happening. So this thing could have more than one action. But if I have a single probability, I'm going to call it a simple event. A compound event, by, by comparison, is a combination of simple events. So this is a situation where I have more than one probability and I have to have those probabilities interact in some way. I'm going to have to do something with those different probabilities. On that note, probability is our likelihood of something happening. Um, our outcome is the result of the experiment. So it could be one event, it could be more than one event. And the sample space is all the possible outcomes. So our rules for probability, these are just some basic setup. When I say P of E, P parentheses event E, this is the probability that event E occurs. This is just a notation. That probability is going to be somewhere between 0 and 1, or if it's easier for you to think about, between 0% and 100%. And the sum of all our probabilities is going to be 100%. If I take all the items in my sample space, and I add up their probabilities, it should add up to 100%. And often, the word unusual takes on special meaning in statistics and in probability. And for us, we're going to define unusual to be that probability being less than 5%. We have a couple different kinds of probability that we see in everyday life and in statistics. So our first one is empirical probability. This comes from an experiment. Anytime you hear the word empirical, it means someone actually did something. It's something happened in the real world. So the probability of our empirical probability is just the relative frequency. It's how many successes did I have out of how many trials I did. If I flip a coin 100 times and get heads 32 times, my probability of heads is 32 out of 100. Classic probability comes from more of a thought experiment. I'm thinking about it. When you think about flipping a coin, you think, okay, there's two things that could happen. I could get heads, I could get tails. We usually ignore the possibility of it ending up on its edge. And each of those has an equal chance. So my classical probability for flipping a coin for getting heads would be one out of two. Two things that could happen, they're both equally likely. Subjective probability is just an educated guess. Now in statistics, we don't tend to talk about subjective probability all that much, but it is something you encounter in your everyday life. Next, we have the law of large numbers. Law of large numbers tells us a lot of things. For this particular section, when we're talking about empirical probability, the more times I do an experiment, the more likely that my empirical probability is going to become get really close to the actual probability. So if I flip a coin 10 times, the odds of getting 50-50, eh, not that great. You know, I could see getting seven heads, for instance, and having a probability of getting of heads being 70%. If I flip it a hundred times, maybe that's more like 60 or 45. If I flip it a thousand times, I should get really close to 500. So that probability is going to get closer and closer in general the more times I do an experiment. So just in summary for this, we've got classical probability versus empirical probability. Empirical is going to be when you're actually doing an experiment. Now in statistics classes, this is usually as far as we go because in all honesty, there's not that much more to talk about it. You do the experiment and you figure out your relative frequency. Classical we'll talk about more in future videos. And just in general, your probability is the number of successes over the total outcomes. However you get those. A lot of the problems you can come back to this idea, especially if they give you a good story. 
and come back to this and not make it any more complicated than counting up how many successes I have and how many total outcomes I can have. So do keep that in mind as you go through problems. So the next thing we need to talk about is listing outcomes. This is really important when I need to get that number of total successes or more commonly that number of total outcomes. So first of all, going back to our sample space, this is our list of all things that could happen. There's a couple different ways you can do this. You can say, all right, I've got three goals for Saturday, laundry, bike to, par bike to the park, and study for statistics, or whatever your class happens to be titled. And you could go through and list all the possible options. So for instance, I've done it here. Now I wanna note when I make this list, I like to keep my list organized. So I started with, let's say I do laundry first. Well, then I could do bike second, statistics third, or I could do statistics second and bike third. Okay, now let me go to my second option. Let's say I biked first. So my next two are with bike first. I could do laundry and statistics or statistics and laundry. So having some sort of an organization is helpful when you're making a list. However, these lists can get really painful really fast. It's hard to make sure you got every possible item. So let's say you had to list all the possible outcomes of flipping a coin four times. This is going to get pretty big pretty fast. So we have some methods to keep us organized. The most common one you see is a tree diagram. So I list my first outcome here. I could get heads or I could get tails. So next I look at, okay, let's say the scenario I got heads on my first roll. Okay, then I could get heads on my second roll or tails on my second flip. If I got heads and then heads, what could happen here? Okay, I could get heads or tails. If I got heads and then tails, what could happen? So I'm just going through and telling a story. I got heads, then I got heads, then I got heads. What could happen on the fourth one? I got heads, I got tails, I got tails. Okay, what could happen on the fourth one? So I'm just listing each of those. Now each of these last ones represents an outcome. So this one right here is heads, tails, heads. These tree diagrams get really big really fast, unfortunately. So here, heads, tails, tails, heads. So some problems that I can have you do. Go ahead and pause the video here and see if you can go through these particular ones. Tamaro's Trattoria gives you the choice of three pasta shapes and five sauces. So how many possible outcomes could you get? And then linking back, what's the probability my date chooses chili with garlic? So for the first one, here I have Tamaro's Trattoria. I could have spaghetti, rotini, or angel hair for my first choice. Now there's no reason why I have to choose my pasta shape first. It came first in the problem, which is why I chose to organize it this way. But I could have listed my sauce first, and then for marinara, had three possible second choices for my pasta. For pesto, I could have had spaghetti, rotini, or angel hair. So I could organize it the other way, and I get the same result. For Brenda's bike booth, could have chosen tangerine, banana, cafe noir, or dollar bill. This is the type of problem a lot of statistic texts like because your two options for the basket are with the basket or without the basket. So you do have two choices there. So do look for those, those scenarios where you can have with or without something.